In addition to praying the rosary on the five first Saturdays of the month and making the communion of reparation, Our Lady has asked us to keep her company for 15 minutes, meditating upon one of the mysteries contained in her holy rosary. Today we join her in contemplating the descent of the Holy Spirit on Our Lady and the Apostles. St. Alphonsus relates, The Eternal Father was not content with giving us his Son, Jesus Christ, to save us by his death. He has also given us the Holy Spirit to dwell always in our souls and keep them inflamed with his love. Hence, when the Holy Spirit descended upon the Apostles, he appeared in the form of tongues of fire. This is the holy fire that inflamed the saints with the desire to do great things for God, that enabled them to love their most cruel enemies, to seek after contempt, to renounce all the riches and honours of the world, and even to embrace torments and death. And so as we contemplate the historical events of the day of Pentecost, we remain in thanksgiving to the Holy and Blessed Trinity for deigning to stay with us through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The mystery of Pentecost is not removed for us, but as baptized and confirmed Catholics, we share in it most intimately. St. Maximus the Confessor explains Our Lady's role prior to the descent of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Mother of Christ was, after the Ascension, the model and leader of every good activity for men and for women through the grace and support of her glorious King and Son. And that is why she then instructed the holy apostles in fasting and prayer. And they were devoted to fasting and prayer and supplication until the 50th day was completed. The day that they would be filled with the grace of the comforting Holy Spirit. Our Lady is then very much present in the mystery of Pentecost. She's there in the upper room, waiting with the disciples during the first novena of prayer. Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich relates, I saw the apostles always together and the Blessed Virgin always with them in the house of the Last Supper. I saw Mary when at prayer and breaking of bread always opposite St. Peter, who now took the Lord's place in the prayers and at meals. And yet the disciples, the apostles, while united with Our Lady, are at this point frightened, unable to go out and proclaim the truth of our Lord's holy death and resurrection. They need the help from on high. Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich describes the beginnings of the day of Pentecost. After midnight, there arose a wonderful movement in all nature. It communicated itself to all present in the upper room as they stood in deep recollection, their arms crossed on their breasts, Near the pillars of the supper room and in the side halls, they silently prayed. Stillness pervaded the house and silence reigned throughout the enclosure. And then, towards morning, above the Mount of Olives, I saw a glittering white cloud of light coming down from heaven and drawing near to the house. Coming nearer, 
It looked larger and floated over the city like a luminous mass of fog. And still it, still it stood over the house, over Zion. It seemed to contract and to shine with constantly increasing brightness, until at last, with a rushing, roaring noise as a wind, it sank like a thundercloud floating low in the atmosphere. Imagine the sight, my dear friends. Imagine what the Jews thought as they saw this luminous cloud beginning to overshadow one particular house. Blessed Emmerich relates, the whole thing was like a storm that had suddenly gathered. I felt that rushing motion. It was like a warm breeze, full of power to refresh and invigorate. With increasing sound, the light of the cloud became brighter. I saw the house and its surrounding more clearly, while the apostles, the disciples and the women became more and more silent, deeply recollected. Afterwards, there shot from the rushing cloud streams of white light down upon the house and its surroundings. The streams intersected one another in sevenfold rays. The point at which the seven streams intersected was surrounded by a rainbow light in which floated a luminous figure with outstretched wings or rays of light that looks like wings. In that same instant, the whole house and its surroundings were penetrated through and through with light. The assembled faithful were ravished in ecstasy. Each involuntarily threw back his head and raised his eyes eagerly on high, while into the mouth of each one there flowed a stream of light like a burning tongue of fire. It looked as if they were breathing, as if they were eagerly drinking in the fire, and as if their ardent desire flamed forth from their mouth to meet the entering flame. They gathered around the Blessed Virgin, who was, I saw, the only one perfectly calm, the only one that retained a quiet, holy self-possession. The apostles embraced one another, and urged by joyous confidence, exclaimed, What were we? What are we now? The holy women too embraced, a new life full of joy, of confidence, and of courage had been infused into all. We contemplate, moreover, the fact that like the day of the Annunciation, a great joy filled nature, pervaded all nature at this moment. The good were roused interiorly, the weak while the wicked were filled with confusion. The event of the descent of the Holy Spirit is not then an event confined to that upper room, to that house where the disciples and Our Lady were staying. It was Almighty God's action in our world, an action that continues through the sacraments. St. Alphonsus relates, We contemplate how Jesus Christ, seated at the right hand of the Father, sent down the Holy Spirit to the chamber where the Apostles and the Virgin Mary were assembled. Before receiving the Holy Spirit, the Apostles were so feeble, so cold in the love of God, that at the time of the Passion of our Lord, one betrayed him, another denied him, all abandoned him. But as soon as they had received the Holy Spirit, they were so much inflamed with love that they gave up their lives generously for Christ. He who loves 
does not labor. He who loves God feels no affliction under crosses, but rather rejoices. Let us ask of Our Lady to obtain for us from the Holy Spirit the gift of divine love, for then all the crosses of this life will seem sweet to us. O oh, Holy Spirit, you are the sweet guest of my soul, and I know, blessed Spirit, that you will not forsake me in any danger unless I forcefully drive you away. I know, most Holy Spirit, that you will have no rivals in the heart. And so, if you are not the sole object loved, then you are jealous. You command me to cast out the creatures that are dividing my heart. You desire to have my heart entirely for yourself. In the canticle, the spouse is called the garden enclosed. The Holy Spirit wishes each one of us to be that garden enclosed, enclosed against all earthly love, a true temple to the Holy Spirit, as St. Paul calls the Christian. St. Bridget of Sweden relates how Our Lady continued to help the early church and she continues to help us now as disciples filled with the Holy Spirit. When Christ ascended to the glory of his kingdom, the Virgin Mary remained on earth. We cannot know what her presence meant to so many. Those who loved God were strengthened in their love. Those who had turned from him were brought back to his love. The apostles looked to her for guidance and counsel. The martyrs found in her courage to face suffering and death. The confessors of the faith were strengthened in their believing. Virgins were drawn to her purity. Widows were consoled by her sorrows. Husbands and wives found in her a pattern of perfection. All who heard and obeyed the word of God found in Mary great comfort and help. Whenever the apostles came to her, she was able to teach them about Christ and help them to understand. The martyrs remembered the long years of sorrow borne so patiently by Mary, our Lord's mother, and they bore their martyrdom even more readily. Confessors meditating on Mary learnt many things about the truths of the faith. From her example, they learned too the wise use of earthly things, of food, drink and sleep, work and rest. Virgins learnt from Mary's example true chastity in virtue. They learnt too the wise use of their time, how to avoid vanity and false talk, and to see all things in the light of true holiness. Widows learnt from her consolation in sorrow, strength against temptation, and humble submission to God's holy will. My dear friends, Our Lady, the spouse of the Holy Spirit, always remained at the centre of the apostolic community and she remains as the spouse of the Holy Spirit and must remain likewise at the center of our community. We too, in our lives as disciples, in our efforts to follow Christ, must turn to her, must seek, as St. Bridget of Sweden describes, all the benefits that our Lord wishes us to have through a relationship with his mother, who he has made our mother, and Mediatrix of all graces. Saint Gregory the Great will conclude our meditation. He writes, My friends, 
consider the greatness of this solemn feast that commemorates God's coming as a guest into our hearts. If some rich and influential friend were to come to your home, you would promptly put it in order for fear that something there might offend your friend's eye when he came in. Let all of us then, who are preparing our homes for God and wish our homes to be a place for God, cleanse them of everything our wrongdoing has brought into them. O oh, Blessed Mother Mary, help us. Help us to be temples of the Holy Spirit. You are the one who magnify the Holy Spirit. Gain his presence more strongly in each one of us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.